Hello, my compachos! It's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today we continue with the third turn of the Shadow Tech Goddess, Stenabel. In our last chapter, we see Stenabel taking the initiative. She is greatly concerned about the well being of Lady Lessa and for that matter, for the rest of the crew that she believes is sequestered in the hold. She gets a calm out to Professor Sherlamp, trying to warn her of what's happening here. However, the professor doesn't really have any interest in protecting the crew. She just wants the information to camera and that's it. She does warn Stenabel that their conversation has been noted on the bridge and that a detail has been sent to investigate. They promptly arrive. Stenabel turns invisible, fading into the shadows as she is adept at doing. They come in. It's a couple of punks, a guy with a shaved head and a girl with a nose ring and pink hair. And Stenabel decides to strike. She webs them up with green holy stones, which she's fully capable of doing. She then gives them both a good jab with a bunch of psychotropic chemicals, rendering their minds extremely susceptible to suggestion. She frightens them with the prospect of flesh-eating insects and manages to get them on her side, at least to some extent. They tell her that most of the crew gets sent down to hole four at the bottom of the ship and they don't ever come back that these creepy robed people that came with the zaffin and they're talking about rodrigo of bergen came with the zaffin and that's where they hang out in hole four and once these girls go in there they do not come out stenabel determines that the tattoo on Lady Lessa's arm is the cause of her malady and by cutting across it will allow Shadow Tech to drain out of her body. So if Stenabel does that, carefully scores the tattoo with one of her marzible daggers and the Shadow Tech quickly drains out and Lady Lessa promptly awakens. Stenabel tells her she's going to send her to safety on Planetfall using one of her precious brown holy stone she only has three and she's going to use one to save lady lessa and she tells her to go see the local magistrate get in touch with lieutenant gwendolyn aboard the demophilon john and spill the beans on the sinister doings aboard the george park that done Stenabel tries to make a comm out to Lieutenant Gwendolyn, finds the comm terminal is locked out. They then go up to Julia of Fountainlock's billet on deck three, which has been turned into a gothic punk rock wasteland of drugs, trash, urine, and other foul things. In Julia Fountainlock's quarters, Stenabel is able to reach Lieutenant Gwendolyn and tells her all about what's going on on the George Park. So that's where we are currently. Stenabel is beginning to stretch out her wings as a bona fide hero. And now that she knows that the main evil doings are going on at the bottom of the ship in this creepy hold four, you can bet your bottom dollar that's where Stenabel is headed. With her two slightly brain all Altered Campachos, Julia Fountainlock, and Willard of Falconer, sort of like the Brady Bunch, where they're a bunch of wayward children, and Stenabel is their mother. So let's proceed immediately. This week, we are reading Chapter 10, The Statue Moved, and we are only about 50 pages until we're done with Stenabel. It's a very small book in relation to my other works, which are much bigger, have a much larger word count, but as I always said, I write until I'm done, and then I was done. Basically, once you get into it, this is a very simple story, but we will see how this progresses. Chapter 10, The Statue Moved. Tell me about Rodrigo of Bergen, Stenabel demanded. We don't know much about him. He stays on deck two with the captain most of the time. Sometimes he goes into the hold. And the tall woman, his tropist, what of her? She's just always there with him, never says nothing. Just doing that touching thing she does. Stenabel thought for a moment. She had to get to Melazar. She had two brown holy stones left. 
one for Melazar and one for herself. Come, we are to deck two, and there we shall claim Melazar of Caroline. Both Julia and Willard were alarmed. Can't go up there right now. They're on alert to your presence and have V-Trax the deck. We haven't been administered the antidote. We go up there, we're gonna be dead, Julia said. Stenabel grit her teeth. Damn. She thought some more and changed her tactic. I saw a photo in Lady Lessa's camera depicting a group of sinister robe people boarding the ship several months back. Who are they? Stenabel demanded. Outside the door was a din of talking and people blundering about. There were shouts and groans, bottles breaking, and lurid sounds of drug-fueled sex. It is often servants, Julia said. They're guarding some sort of treasure in the hold. We were afraid of them and stayed out of their way. Down in the holds. That's where they take the women, Willard said. We aren't permitted to go down there except to take the crew there. They do not come back. Annabelle rubbed her chin and thought out loud. Alright, if I can no longer get to them on deck two, then I'll need to bring them to me. But where? Bergen kept talking about the hold. She turned to Julia. In what hold are the Zaffin servants set up? Hold four. I want to see what's there. Let's go. Lead the way. You two won't see me while we're walking, but I'll be there certain enough. But we don't want to see them, Willard protested. I shall protect you. Come now. Let's go. They exited to the noisy, trash-filled hallway and headed for the lift, Stenabel following from the shadows. She carefully observed the two crewmen, looking for signs of recovery. So far, they both appeared to be under her sway. They entered the lift and went down to the bowels of the ship, to the whole decks. While en route, the calm clicked on. What? Are you two idiots doing? came the angry voice of Rem Deckard. Julia and Willard glanced at each other. Then Julia answered, Ma'am, we are currently searching for the suspected intruder. What is taking so long? The comm noted an unauthorized activity in crew billet number 47S. What did you discover there? Nothing, ma'am. The, the intruder fled before we arrived. And you scanned for use of gifts? Yes, ma'am. We, we found nothing. There was an irritated pause. Then, you are currently in lift number five. Where are you headed and why? Julia appeared stumped and unable to answer. Ma'am, this is Crewman Willard, he said, jumping in. We are headed to the Ripcar Bays to determine if the intruder is attempting to get off the ship there. We're heading down, Deckard replied. We shall handle this matter personally. Check the bays and then return to your duty stations. The both of you shall be fortunate if I don't put you off the ship myself. The comm snapped off. Both Julia and Willard appeared quite frightened. She'll do it, too, Julia mumbled. I didn't sign up for this. I just want it out of Inari. Her long face mismatched with her festive pink hair. She reached into her pocket, hoping to pop a magatab, but her pockets were empty. Stenabel was torn between pity for these two and disdain, as they were both addicts and were complicit in the endangerment of the bulk of the crew. All right, I want you both to do as commanded, and then return to your duty stations. And... I am warning you, if you betray me, I shall find you and allow my lovely insects to have another go at your brains, making a spacing seem like a nice cool plunge, understand? Willard stood, trying to sort things out in his head. What insects? Where are they? He asked. He was recovering from the effects of the narcotics, trying to get his thoughts right. They're here, Stenabel replied, cupping her hands and holding them out. Willard dubiously looked at her empty hands. See them? Glistening? Hungry? So soft, yet so relentless. Ready to feast on your innards one little bite at a time. Willard stared at her cupped hands. A bead of nervous sweat rolled down his cheek. Stenabel kept up the pressure. Here! Want a closer look? She thrust her hands up into his face and he recoiled. He was still seeing a handful of squirming horrors in Stenabel's hands. No, no, please. I'm sorry. I'll do what you say. I swear. Good. Very good. 
They stood in wretched silence for the remainder of the trip in the lift. It stopped on deck five, and the two got out. One more duck, Julia said as she exited and the doors closed. Alone in the lift, Stenabel checked her gear. She shook her hand, and two brown holy stones appeared. She was certain the two crewmen would betray her shortly, and the ship would be turned out in force against her. But, as long as she held these two stones, she could exit at her whim. She was in no danger, and she had to get Bergen and Melazar of Caroline out of v tracks Deck 2 and down to the hold, where they would be out in the open. She figured she could go into the hold and interdict Bergen's servants, create chaos, spill his shadow tech upon the floor, and that should bring him running. And with luck, he'll bring Melazar with him. Then, she'll crack her on the forehead with the brown holy stone, and that will be that. The lift came to a stop, and the doors opened, revealing a lonely, workmanlike lower deck thrumming with the sounds of the living ship. Nobody seemed to be present. She walked out, still safely faded into the shadows. Her various danger detectors immediately went off, vibrating with force deep in the pockets of her HRN. She drew her Grenville 40 just to be on the safe side. She maneuvered through the twists and turns of the deck and arrived at hold 4. Three K-lister crewmen stood in sloppy guard with heat weapons hanging at their sides. The massive outer doors to the hold were closed. She needed an opportunity to enter undetected. The guards certainly were weren't overly diligent. They passed the time talking and playing at games of chance. They passed a flask back and forth. One popped a magatab and drifted away in cooped up bliss. Stenabel took note of the door lock to the hold. No palm lock this time. Instead, it was a complex five-character glyph. She struggled as more Seralcone information from Professor Sherlamp rattled her brain and once again provided the answers. She knew the code, and the guards seemed too cooped up to care. Faded into the shadows, she walked past the guards, entered the code, and the doors to the hold swung open. She entered, and the doors closed behind her. The lighting within was down, and the atmosphere was dank. The metal floor of the hold was covered in a thick layer of loamy earth, which smelled heavily of peat. It would have been a rather nice, rich smell had it not been so smothering in the air. The dirt was soft under her boots, like it had been freshly plowed and was quite thick in the center of the hold, at least several feet deep. Stenabel had to climb a small mound of it to reach the plateau at the center. In the center of the hold was a great black statue at least 15 feet tall. It was seated in a basin or cistern partially filled with thick black fluid. Shadow Tech. Surrounding the statue was a host of odd, fern-like plants waving in an unfelt breeze. The plants were a dull ochre color, roughly five feet high, with a thin, cattail-like stalk supporting a palm-shaped flowering body with five distinct petals or runs pointed upward in a gentle curve. The stalks were situated two by two and arranged in messy rows around the perimeter of the cistern. Stenabel squinted. As she approached, those nearest to her reacted as if sensing her proximity. They bobbed. Their petals flicked and undulated in and out like a hand opening and closing. She stepped back. Denabel puzzled at the statue. It seemed to be a depiction of a robed female wearing a conical helmet that completely covered her face, revealing no trace or features whatsoever. Was this Bergen's shadow tech goddess? And was this statue supposed to give him the coordinates to camera? The man must truly be mad. Activity further back in the hold caught Stenabel's attention. Constructed at the rear of the hold was a large platform surrounded on three sides by great tankers made of shiny silver metal. Mounted on top of the platform was a small chamber with a sturdy piston situated over top of it. Piled up near the platform were a number of containers similar to the one Lady Lessa had been confined 
Boynton, attending at the platform were several stunted, dwarf-like people dressed in coarse robes. Those must be Bergen's servants. Julie had said they were dwarves. In steady, workmanlike fashion, they hauled the containers to the top of the platform. Opening the containers, they pulled females out who were so bloated they barely looked like people at all, but rather blackened bags of ruddy, liquid-filled flesh. The dwarves expected them and then placed them within the vault-like chamber and sealed it tight. The piston came down and Stenabel heard the pitiful sounds of bones breaking and flesh tearing within the chamber. Thick, black liquid gushed from a spout and drained into one of the tankards. Stenabel had witnessed the woman within the chamber being pressed like a grape to harvest shadow tech. This was the fate that had been awaiting Crewman Lessa and the rest. She was horrified. Moving up and down the wall was a line of dwarves crawling up the sheer face to the ceiling, moving in ant-like precision. They were busy hauling the containers from a service hatch in the ceiling, collecting fresh containers and removing the empties. Her plan had been to come into the hold and create chaos. She hadn't expected any of this. What should she do? She counted at least 20 dwarves milling about. Punts, Bergen had called them. By the manner in which they lugged the containers, they seemed quite strong, and they could cling to the wall. Their full capabilities were unknown. She had no Seracone information on them to draw from. She wished for a moment she had her bullabungs again. She had no idea what to do. The doors to the hole opened. She heard ragged screams. Please, I told you everything. I swear it. It was an enchantress who could turn invisible. She tortured us. She made us help her. It was Julia, pink haired and face washed, and she was being manhandled by Rem Deckard, dragging her in by the scruff of her neck. Julia gagged and feebly kicked. Consider this your punishment for failure. If you're still alive at the end of the hour, we'll let this matter pass. With one arm, Deckard threw Julia deep into the depths of the hold and the door slid shut. All activity stopped. The punch all turned to Julia as she crawled in the dirt. She tried to cower in the dark. Her blinking neon 4D tattoo gave her position away. Several came at her, covering the ground fast and hauled her off her feet to the platform. They stripped her bare and tossed her clothes aside, revealing her tattooed and pierced body. All the while, she sobbed and begged for mercy. She found none. The dwarves ripped the piercings from her body and she screamed in pain. An empty container was brought up. Two dwarves held her down while a third scratched a black tattoo into her arm, covering one that was already there that said, Julia loves... Question mark. Julia squirmed in terrified misery. No, no, go away, please, go, go away. She cried. Then, mother, help me, please. Stenabel's conscience was proving to be persistent and inconvenient. She had already used one of her brown holy stones on Lady Lessa, and now here was Julia. A pink-haired ah. vagabond from Tobruk in deep distress. Lessa had deserved to be saved. But Julia? She didn't know this woman. Was angered by her sloth. She was complicit in the doings on this ship. And she was going to burn Lessa without hardly a thought. Yet she couldn't take the sound of her screams. And if she allowed Julia to suffer this terrible fate, it would be something she would never forget. She acted. She pulled the hammer on her Grenville 40 and shook her free hand producing three marzible daggers between her fingers. She uncoiled her vuncula and readied it for battle. She fired and slashed in with her daggers and engaged the punts carving the tattoo in Julia's arm. She buried two bullets into his head. The other two spun about, unable to see her. She attacked, the vuncula emerging from her HRN like a sledgehammer, blowing the punts back off the platform. A punt reached in her direction and she sliced through his arm like soft gelatin. Tepid, brackish fluid came out, gushing as the punt uttered a 
fearful graveyard cry. She blew his head off with another slug from her gun. The final punt, unable to see her, did something completely unexpected. It reached up and ripped its own head off, throwing it to the platform. It reeked of shadow tech. The head, though disembodied, still lived, and it shifted about with snake-like movements. It seemed to see her, though she was faded into the shadows, and uttered a hideous bellow, giving away her position. More punts came in, scurrying down the walls, moving with surprising speed. Fresh quarry awaited. They attacked in mass, testing the air, searching for her. The head bounded towards her and it latched onto her HRN with its teeth. She kicked it away, shot at it, waved up some red holy stones and set it on fire. The punts came in fast, reaching, grabbing, finding her invisible body. Denabelle moved to her right and lopped off the limbs of several more punts, which did not seem to inconvenience them in the slightest. She emptied her Grenville 40 and tossed it aside. She switched back to the Vuncula and let them have it, rocking them off the platform with devastating blows. Several moved on Julia and her tortured wails filled the hold. Stenabel produced one of her all-important brown holy stones and tossed it at her. It hit her in the back and broke open. The maiden appeared and they were both gone in a smoky flash. That's it. Julia was now on planet fall. She had just saved her. Now Stenabel was down to one. Her plan of escaping to planet fall with Melo Lazar was gone. As she fought for her life, Stenabel vaguely wondered what Julia would do if she ever saw her again. Would she be grateful? Would she offer her thanks? Perhaps buy her a beer? Would she have cleaned herself up? Perhaps she'd do none of those things. Perhaps she'd just keep walking down the street. The punts were overrunning the platform. She bounded down and sprinted through the soft earth. The punts hot on her heels following her boot prints in the soft earth. As she neared the statue, the plants surrounding it rustled. Slowly, the earth moved and dark punt shapes emerged as if sitting up from being in a reclined position. The ferns were actually their forearms and hands extending through the dirt and stretched to an impossible length. They made a droning, chattering sort of sound and they stank of shadow tech. She jumped up onto the rim of the cistern and fought them. Her daggers tore through their ranks, dropping bits of flesh and boneless appendages. They backed away as Stenevel pressed the attack. She drew red holy stones and let them fly. More smoke. More fire. The punts went up like dried cordwood, burning fiercely, but unfortunately, they didn't fall. They seemed to have an outer husk of flesh that burned readily, revealing a black, utterly alien form within, stunted and bone-like, their bodies hosting a series of curved tubes and protrusions, and a compaction of fossilized organs within their ribs. Their heads grew between their shoulders. Glaring black eyes stared at her. The fire didn't seem to harm them in the least. Instead, it liberated them. It was like fighting demons. The punts regrouped and counterattacked, pressing forward in a relentless wave. They pulled their heads off their own bodies, revealing a ragose, orange skin, green haired face under the robes. They then lobbed the heads in her general direction like dire grenades. They hit the floor of the hold and bounced like a rubber ball, shadow tech spewing from their mouths in a spray like hot tar. Shadow tech rained down on her. She could feel its effects, the frigid tears, the toxic caress, draining the life from her. The onslaught was devastating and Stenabel had to back away. Clenched hands came forward searching for her invisible body. One found her leg and locked on. Another had her and then another. She hacked and slashed but it did little good. Dozens of hands had her. She fell out of the shadows and punts reached for her throat. They locked on and pierced her flesh with their hard claws. Shadow tech was pumped in and she felt it coursing into her system poisoning her. She felt herself drifting into unconsciousness. She had a number of reagents and poison neutralizers in the deep pockets of her HRN, but she had nothing to counteract shadow tech. Use your last holy stone. I can't. I don't have the data. Her vision went fuzzy. In desperation, she launched her vuncula. She felt the battle club clamp onto the statue behind her, and she grappled up the side, finding a nook to crawl into. The punts assaulted her with a steady stream of heads, 
arms, legs, and other body parts lobbed up from below. She felt a great shudder, as if the ground beneath her were shaking. The punks below stopped what they were doing and backed away. Struggling to remain conscious, she vaguely puzzled at what was happening. She heard metal bending and joints creaking. A great hand came up and plucked Stenabel from her position. You can't stay here. You've got to go. She waved up her final brown holy stone to flee, to get away. Her mission a failure. Perhaps she was hallucinating. So much shadow tech in her system. But the statue of the shadow tech goddess was moving with steady, fluid life. She was placed in the statue's palm. A gigantic, helmeted head stared down at her. Stenabel tried to crack the holy stone open in her fist, but was too weak. It fell from her hand to the floor far below lost. She closed her eyes and awaited her death. She wondered about her house, her father, her sisters, her passed away mother, and how she'd failed them all. And with that, we conclude chapter 10, The Shadow Moved. So Stenabel hits hold four, finds an odd scene. The hold has been covered with a loamy sort of dirt and the center is a cistern with a gigantic statue of the shadow tech goddess sitting in a pool of shadow tech and there are the punts all over the place like shrunken in robes pressing basically the bloated crew who are filled with shadow tech adding it to the cistern at the base of the statue and then in comes julia fountainlock lieutenant rem deckard intending to sacrifice her to the punts, tosses her in. The punts grab her, strip her bare, and start preparing her to receive shadow tech. And she screamed. She screamed for her life. And Stenabel couldn't bear hearing her screams. Even though it was going to cost her, she decided to help her. She made a choice to help her, to send her to safety on Planetfall, despite the fact it would completely destroy her, her own plans to get Melazar of Caroline off the ship. Stenabel fought the punts with her gun and her vuncula, but they're too alien, too warped with shadow tech. Their bodies are basically a husk and there's, there's like a new alien body deep within and their heads are actually in their like stomach region. It's pretty gross, the punts. This is our first glance at them. I talk about them a lot. We don't really see them too much, but a lot of times they're hiding in the, in the earth and their arms are sticking up and they look like ferns. Burns. You know, with long stretched out forearms and their hands have been elongated that looks like a like a flower of some sort but it's actually their forearms and their hands that the punts do that quite a bit. In Stenabel's presence the statue moved and lifted her into the air regarding her in its palm and that's where we leave off next week chapter 11 captured. So things are going bad for Stenabel. She is loses her battle with the punts it apparently will be captured by the crew of the George Parr, Captain Duval, Rem Deckard, as we see she's not a nice person, and Rodrigo of Bergen. So we'll see what happens next week as we continue chapter 11, Captured. Until then, this is Ren Presents. I'm your host, Ren. Peace out.